Well, welcome to one and all. We are back. We are studying the book of Matthew, but we're starting out here. The homepage I've got up here is the homepage for my website, the Decoding the Deception website. I've got that up there because I want to keep reminding people, you can go out here to our website. We've got all kinds of resources, but what I'm going to show you right now, we've got all our Bible teaching resources out here. So if you want to go somewhere simple to find our latest Bible teachings, there we go. There it is, the last video that we did. You can go out and find it right there on the website. So make sure and go check that out. It's www.decodingthedeception.com. So we are picking up here in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19. Okay. And yeah, we'll just go ahead and jump right in. Teaching about divorce, always an interesting topic. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. This statement here at the beginning, now when Jesus had finished these sayings, is a recurring tool in in Matthew's gospel. It tells us that one section is ended, and he is now moving on to something else. So it's a, it's a transition term that Matthew uses. But it says he went away from Galilee and entered the region beyond the Jordan. And we will pop up, see if I can get it to come up here. Our handy handy map that will pay so much attention with where it's where lines are on the map right now because Jesus was up here in Galilee, and he is left there, and he's not going to go back. Remember, Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. He's on the way to his passion. So he has come down here, and he is at Jerusalem, and he's on this side of the Jordan over here. And then the, this map doesn't have, have Jerusalem on it. Let's see if I can get a map that has... Jerusalem on there will be more, more useful. Now, actually, right here, in this, this is where he is right now. He's over here. It's called the Transjordan, trans meaning across. He is across the Jordan, but he's over here. He's on the way to Jerusalem, but he's not there yet. You have to understand once he crosses the Jordan, and once he goes into Jerusalem, he's going to be swarmed. And we see that. We see that. He is making sure that the timing is his own. He's, his crucifixion is going to be, is going to coincide with the Passover. So he is timing things out. He's not going to Jerusalem yet. And we will see that once he gets to Jerusalem, the intensity of the conflict between him and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, everybody else, everybody comes out of the woodwork to have their shot at him. And even over here, even across the Jordan, still out in the wilderness, so to speak, they're still going to come after him. But he went away from Galilee, went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, as we just saw, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Jesus is always about compassion. The large crowds follow, and Jesus heals. It's it would be interesting to know, and the Gospels don't tell us, it would be interesting to know how many people Jesus healed when there were huge crowds coming around him. And part of me in my own sinful, selfish mindset says he had to get tired of it. And is that that that's a huge <laughs> a huge differentiator between me and Jesus. He never thought that way. He was always more than happy 
to heal the people. He always had compassion on them. So as I look at that for myself and think about how different I am from Jesus in that, not that I can heal people, but just as far as the perspective of of compassion and sympathy and caring for others, that tells me I've got a whole lot more to work on. I've got I've got a ways to go, a long ways to go before I'm anything like him. But that is what we try to do in our walk of faith is to be more and more like the Savior. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? We'll stop right there. Even out here, in in the middle of nowhere, relatively speaking, the Pharisees came to him. Now, were these Pharisees from a smaller town out there? That could be. Or when they knew that he was closer, did they send Pharisees from Jerusalem? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. But they're very eager to test him. And this word here for test, it it is telling us that they're trying to trip him up. The every time that this word is used in the the Pharisees or the Sadducees, and it's generally the Pharisees, in their interaction with Jesus, they're trying to trip him up. They think and, and just stop and just listen to this. They think they can outsmart him. They tried it with the thing about the temple tax. Does your teacher pay the temple tax? They they thought maybe they could get him, right? They're always trying to give him a problem that there's no easy way out of. And they do that here. Now to us, we hear this and there are no flags that pop up. There aren't any, ooh, that's a loaded question. Any of that, because, well, we live in the modern day. Most of us live in these United States or in the Western world, and we do not have the context of what was going on here with this question. They thought they had him because this question, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? There were two prominent teachers one being far more conservative and strict, one being far more lax, more liberal. It's a conservative liberal thing, but a a Pharisee, a Bible teaching thing, okay? If he answered the question one way, he made half the Jews mad. If he answered it the other way, he made the other half mad. And they didn't, I can guarantee you, the guys who came to ask him this question, they didn't care. They wanted to put him on the hot seat. They wanted to get him, because where was he? Out in the middle of nowhere. Who was with him? Oh, I think it says in verse 2, large crowds followed him. They were just trying to peel off some of his popularity. They were trying to take him down a notch at least. And if he answered this question the way they wanted him to, he would have done that. He would have done that. But Jesus wasn't concerned about his popularity. He was concerned with the truth. And the problem is they were looking at it entirely the wrong way. They were concerned, they were focused on the teachings of men. And Jesus doesn't deal with that at all. He goes right to the scriptures. So let's see what it says. And and, and, and this question, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? It comes from Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. And the whole argument that was going on at their time, misapplied what Moses said. Moses said that 
if a man marries a woman and finds anything indecent in her, <clears throat> now there are always several layers we have to peel through whenever we're talking about anything having to do with sexuality in the Old Testament, because they had these euphemistic expressions th that they wouldn't come right out and say something, right? They, they, they talk about covering the feet or he was in his inner chamber. All of these things had to do not necessarily with sexuality, but inner chamber. He was in his inner chamber. You know what that means? He was sitting on the john. That's what it meant. But they didn't come out and say that, okay? And with finding anything indecent in her, well, the word has to do with nakedness. And we would have to go deep down into the, the meaning of how that word is used, but there are those weird things that we have a hard time understanding about uncovering your father's nakedness. Well, th that's a euphemism for sleeping with your father's wife. Okay, so this, this thing in Deuteronomy isn't as simple as they make it seem. Moses didn't just say you can divorce your wife for any reason, but in a patriarchal society, which most of the world has been throughout most of history. Heck, I was born in a patriarchal society. It's changed during my lifetime. In a patriarchal society where women have no power, they have no standing before the law, they couldn't vote, they couldn't speak at the synagogue, they couldn't do anything, things are going to be slanted against them. So if the guy marries a woman and he wants to get rid of her because she gets old, her hair turns gray and she's wrinkly, he can do that. Basically, why? Because the guys were the ones interpreting the Bible. They were the ones interpreting the Torah. So it's misapplied to begin with. It's all slanted one way. But Jesus doesn't go into any of that. He doesn't go into any of that. He just goes to the core teachings of Scripture about man and wife and one flesh and deals with it that way. And, and, and back to Jesus being tested, because they think they're testing him. They think they're going to trip him up, and that is comical on its face. That They think they're going to outsmart him. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think it's going to go so well. What did Jesus do when Satan did the same thing? Satan came and threw some pretty good passages of Scripture at him that he thought he could trip him up, especially in a weakened, worn-down, starving state. What did Jesus do? Where did he go? He went straight to the Word, straight to God's Word itself, and he's going to do the same thing here. Verse 4, he answered, Have you not read? that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become flesh, one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. The last part is Jesus himself. The other parts were all directly from, from Exodus. But, but first, we have to go here. What does he say to him? Have you not read? Again, context. We have to force ourselves to think about this. He's schooling them. He's correcting them. He's saying, uh, excuse me, you seem to be missing this most fundamental of teaching. I know these passages by heart, and compared to these guys, I don't know my Old Testament for anything. He's quoting the most basic teachings about marriage and asking them if they'd read it. No one talked to them this way. No one. They lived in a society where because of who they were and the robes that they wore, everybody knew who the Pharisees were. They wore the equivalent of a uniform, okay? And, and based on how many stripes the thing had on it and all these other things, everybody could tell how high and mighty of a Pharisee 
It was. It's why they dress that way. It's why Jesus makes fun of them for making sure that their phylacteries are broad and, and the hems of their garments are done and all this stuff, right? He's schooling them and no one, no one talked to them this way. He's done it before, but we're going to see if you just start right here at Matthew 19 and follow it through to the end of his interaction with the scribes and Pharisees and the Sadducees, you'll see it, he gets much more direct. He's, he's letting them have it. He calls them whitewashed tombs. He calls them blind leaders of the blind. He's only going to intensify his putting them down, putting them in their place because they are being in. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy when they challenge him and they're trying to trip him up and using haughty words and, and saying great things. You know where I just quoted that from where that comes from that comes from revelation 13, five through 10. I was just doing that video and recording it and preparing it today. The beast says haughty and great things. He was given a mouth by the devil to say haughty and great things. They're talking to God. They're in denial about that. But what they're doing is blasphemous. And he's putting them in their place. And he's also putting them in their place for the sake of those who were around. He wanted them to know these guys are all wrong. Respect them as leaders. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? That's straight from Genesis 127. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. What does hold fast mean? It means you don't let go. It's forever. It's forever. Everyone wants to look for ways out of marriage, and it's not saying that there aren't reasons to get a divorce, but most of the reasons for which people get divorced aren't valid, and they're certainly not valid in God's eyes. I have always said I have performed many wedding ceremonies, and I always tell the couple in advance, no matter what, especially young people who haven't been married before, You've got no idea what you're promising. You're promising things you can't deliver on your own. You need God's help to do it. And, and in the prayers and many wedding services, it's there asking God to bless the couple with the ability to keep the promises that they make. It is the biggest commitment you ever make in this world. And it's a vitally important one because it is the foundation for everything. It is the, 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 the family, the married couple is the foundation for the family. Husband and wife being to each other what they're supposed to be, loving each other, being Jesus to each other, provides the safe, secure, and stable environment in which God wants children raised. That family unit forms the building block of society. So why do you think Satan hates marriage? It also provides the stability, husband and wife, together, being to each other, what God wants them to be to each other, gives them the stability that they need in this world. I know that my spouse isn't going to abandon me. Certainly not now. She's put up with all kinds of nonsense for years, and she's been very patient and wonderful. There's comfort in knowing that the person who knows you best loves you anyway. That's that's an amazing thing, and it's an important thing. To be without that is a very, in comparison, lonely thing. We support each other. We encourage one another. We 
build one another up. We carry one another's burdens. All very important. It's all really good stuff. And big surprise, it was God's idea. It was God's idea. He knew exactly what he wanted. And sinful man and women, but mankind, looks for a way out. I would think that Jesus, God, was very disappointed just with that, just dealing with it. So all of these things that he says, what's here in blue, created from the beginning, Therefore, a man shall leave his father more than that. That's all from Genesis. Some of it repeated in Genesis in 5 2. Then Jesus makes his own declaration on it. Because this isn't from Genesis or the Old Testament, it's from Jesus. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. If you understand that, if you appreciate that, then you are going to approach marriage differently. It it is a commitment. It is a commitment. God brings the two together. It is a commitment. They wanted out of it. We're going to see even his disciples' reaction. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? That's back to that Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. And he doesn't even bother trying to correct them. He just deals with what the real issue is. Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, It was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. What their view of adultery was, especially in the Old Testament, was different than what we think of. And Jesus is saying there is a higher standard. There is a higher standard. The disciples said to him, (laughs) this one always gets me. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. How do you think the women felt about that one? Peter was married. We know Peter was married. How do you think his wife felt about hearing that one? If I can't get out of it, then maybe I shouldn't get into it. Disappointing, to say the least. It, it, it takes a very low, it, 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 it demonstrates a very weak appreciation altogether of what marriage is, why God gave it, and, and what it is about. But he said to them, he just deals with the staying single thing. Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. There are those who prefer to be single. There are those who are better off single. And you might be able to think of some people in your life. I'm not putting those people down. There are some people, they just don't do well in that kind of relationship. There are those who are so dedicated to serving the Lord that they don't want to get married. But nowhere, this is very important, nowhere does it say that those who are pastors, teachers, whatever, aren't that they are supposed to stay single. That is a concoction of man that has caused nothing but problems throughout the history of Roman Catholicism. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive this. If you want to be, if you want to make yourself so that you can't have any distractions of the flesh, and you really think that's what you're supposed to do, Jesus is saying, okay, whatever. And and to us, the idea of being a eunuch, being made a eunuch, and all the guys here go, it's very foreign. 
It's very foreign. It wasn't foreign to them. Eunuchs were common. The Philip shares the gospel with the Ethiopian what? Oh, he was the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Eunuchs, eunuchs could never be accused of what Joseph was accused of by Potiphar, playing hanky-panky with his wife or playing hanky-panky with the king's harem, etc. They weren't distracted by the temptations of the flesh or the attractions of the flesh. So using eunuchs in the court of a ruler or in service of a wealthy person was not uncommon, okay? To us, it's very uncommon. It's not, and I don't know about around the world, et cetera, but it's not practiced in our world today that way. Jesus is talking to people in a time and a place in a different world where it was. So he deals with he deals with the question. And maybe, maybe, I don't know, I just thought of this. So this is just a ah, popped in my head thought. The disciples are saying, oh, maybe they don't maybe they won't have anything to do with marriage. And Jesus is saying, well, if you want to travel down that road, let's talk about eunuchs. Maybe he was kind of pulling them up short a little bit and getting them to think about it. I don't know. But there are these things that are had cultural relevance then that do not have the same cultural relevance today. But by understanding them, we can understand what it is that is being talked about, what it is that is being taught. Okay, we are going to stop there because we're out of time. I thought we would get to the little children. We talked about marriage, and next come the little children. We will get there next time. I appreciate you tuning in. I want to thank you for listening. I want to encourage you. Give us a thumbs up. It really does make a difference. I also invite you to subscribe. And if you subscribe, then make sure and hit the notification bell so that you are made aware when we put out new content. Please share this video with others. Share it on your social media platform. Send it to anyone you think might benefit from this teaching. And finally, come and pay us a visit. This is our website, decodingthedeception.com. If you know our name, you know the website. We've got all our Bible teaching videos out here as well as a host of other resources to help you be informed so that you can decode the deception. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day.